The January 27th meeting of the East Bend <coughs> Board of School Directors is hereby called to order. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our first order of business is the Mayes High School uh, Student Government Association report. Uh, Ms. Uh, Great Grace Comfort and Caitlin Senseth. Okay, I would like to start with a theater update. The performance of Hello Dolly will run March 18th through the 21st at 7 p.m. and March 21st and 22nd also at 2 p.m. in the Emmaus High School Auditorium. The ticket prices are $12 for students and seniors and $14 for adults. Moving on to the Angel Network. The Angel Network gave out 160 food baskets to East Penn families as well as 170 student gifts. We want to say congratulations to the student of the month for this for the last month of December, and that was Alex Landry, Emily Kirshner, Joshua Whalen, Jeffrey Kleinberg, Aaron DeBauer, Bactinia Flor Florestal, Angelique Camacho, Daniel Holbrook, Jordan Naylor, Tylee Singleton, Ethan Zempek, Carly Althaus, Michelle Cox, Heather Augustin, and Gwendolyn Simons. Um, moving on to the LCTI Students of the Month for December, they include Kayla Lowen for Cosmetology, Gabrielle Holworth, Culinary Arts, D'Angela Tyner, Supply Chain Management, Gabriel Helmer, Heating and Air Conditioning, Janelle Il Ilvin, Painting and Decorating. On Thursday, January 2nd, over 70 Emmaus High School students participated in the History Day competition. The first and second place projects in each category will advance to the regional competition at Muhlenberg College on Saturday, March 21st. 50 students earned either first, second, or honorable mention in the History Day competition. And on January 15th, all Emmaus High School students received a wristband that promoted suicide prevention awareness within our school and community. This will hopefully spark conversation between students and teachers. Um, for our athletic update, um, our for the volleyball team, actually, Macy Vanden Nelson was Pennsylvania's Gatorade Player of the Year, and she competed in the All-American Under Armour Games in Florida, and her team had won. In diving, Brandon McCourt um, was coordinated health, health's player of the week and also broke many pool records this year already, even breaking a couple of his own. For swimming, boys and girls are currently on a winning streak and their, their next meet is against Central Catholic on January 30th. Um, wrestling, um, Caden Wright won his 100th match and the team will compete in first round of districts this Thursday at Northampton High School. Our boys basketball team dropped to 15 and 14, 5 and 14 in the season and won't make it to postseason after losing to Pottstown, Northampton, and Parkland. Their next game is this Tuesday against Nazareth High School. Girls basketball dropped 7 and 10 in their season after losing to Northampton, Parkland. But their next game is this Thursday, this Tuesday as well, but at Nazareth High School. Our rifle team will compete in the All-Star Tournament on January 30th at East Strasburg South High School and the team tournament on February 4th. Are there any questions for our student representatives? Dr. Munson? Yeah, just a, a, I didn't catch the number of uh, the awards during History Day that the East Penn students had won. Um, it said 50 students earned either first, second, or honorable mention. I didn't have a specific like award count, but I knew 50 were able to. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Well, thank you both for your reports. Um, you're welcome to stay. You're also welcome to uh, go home and get your work done and uh, get some sleep. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Moving on to requests to address the board, I have one from Mr. Sal uh, Ver Verastera uh, from the uh, topic of uh, East Penn School District Education Foundation update. Good evening, board members. Um, thank you for the time to address the board. My name is Sal Verastera. I'm the immediate past president of the East Penn School District Education Foundation. Uh, I have two reasons to talk to you tonight. Uh, one is to let you know that the foundation is doing 
had this most successful year and doing very well. Uh, and we expect even a better and brighter future. Just to name a few items that we were successful on last year in 2019, we gave out $15,000 to the Innovation Teacher Grants. And um, we had almost $50,000 contributed to the district through EITC money. And those went towards district uh, important endeavors that you selected and we heard back from the board. Uh, second, I just wanted to make mention that actually in this room tonight, we have four people who were on our board who have participated quite a bit. And uh, Laura Grow behind me is our community liaison person, a very passionate and dedicated person. I don't know what we would do without her. And of course, our superintendent, Kristen Campbell, has um, been a great supporter of ours since she joined the board. And uh, Josh Levinson, uh, he's on our board as well. He's been on the board for quite some time and continues on as a school board director. And the three of them will continue on um, till next year, which is great, and then their dedication to the board will continue as a, as a director. But I'm here tonight to give special thanks to Dr. Ken Bacher, who's been on our board since its inception. He was one of the original directors. And three years ago, he stepped up to the plate without hesitation, I was told, by his wife, <laughs> uh, when we asked for a member of this board, and he stepped up. And he's been a great addition to our board, and it's very much appreciated. We didn't get to thank him personally at our last board meeting, and as you all know, and we quickly found out, uh, that Mr. Bacher is very quiet most of the time. But when he does have something to offer, he offers it with passion and uh, di diplomacy. His contributions to the foundation were nothing less than excellent. Uh, we're going to miss him tremendously. Um, I know the entire board will, will miss him. Uh, so Dr. Bacher, I want to publicly thank you for your tenure on the board. It was tremendous. It was, uh, the, the best thing about it, I got to know you better. And uh, I learned a lot from you. And because of you, we got off to a really good start as a foundation entering our fourth year. And lastly, I want to thank the entire board um, for your support during my tenure as president. Uh, I don't I couldn't have done it without, without the support here and, and the people that preceded you. So keep up the great work and go Hornets. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving on to approval of minutes. Um, may I have a motion? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Next is the uh, presentation of the 2020-2021 preliminary budget. Mrs. Campbell and Mr. Saul. Good evening, Mr. Saul and I are excited to officially kick off the budget season by sharing with the board and our community an overview of our preliminary budget for 2020-21. As we often do, we think it's very important first to ground us all with a clear goal as well as some objectives that help to support that goal. So you can see there our goal throughout the budget process would be to expand educational opportunities for all East Penn students while balancing that with the financial health of the organization. And you can see there our objectives then to help us achieve that budget goal would be supporting diverse learners. Again, you'll notice all students being a theme that's repeated throughout the goal and objectives. Particularly, we're looking at the diverse learning needs of our special education population. A second objective would be to increase our efforts to support the social and emotional wellness of our students through a continuum of services. And for those of you who were with us at the time of our comprehensive plan being approved, you recognize that social and emotional wellness is also a priority that's been articulated in our comprehensive plan. We also, this budget cycle, uh, hope to continue with the implementation of elementary literacy resources and finally, continue to support students and staff in the use of technology. So as we go through the presentation this evening, as well as as we work throughout the winter and early spring in our future budget presentations, we will continue to emphasize ways in which those priorities anchor back to our goals and objectives. 
We wanted to begin by also providing the board with an overview of our budget timeline. And so you can see where we are this evening, sort of our starting point in the process. And eventually, after a series of mini budget presentations, we will then conclude on June 8th, at which time um, the board will vote on the final budget. We're following a similar process to what we followed last year in that what we what we did is we took an in-depth dive at each of the district priorities and so i'll point those out for you in the timeline this evening in particular next month february 10th we plan to come back and go into much greater detail the district priorities that are specific to staffing of both professional as well as our power professional or support staff we then plan to follow up at the second meeting in february looking very closely at the district priorities, specifically those that are related to programs. And then finally, the first board meeting in March will finish up with really di diving into the district priorities, specifically by looking at those administrative staffing budget priorities. And we will also, at that March meeting, take a look at our long-range fiscal as well as the capital plan. So I just want to reiterate that our goal this evening really is to provide that high, high level perspective of the budget. And certainly, um, after Mr. Saul goes through some of the specifics of the budget, we will talk about the priorities that we've established for the 2021. But we really are providing just a high level over, overview of those priorities this evening. And certainly, it is then our intention to follow up with those in much greater detail in shorter segments in, in multiple budget meetings. When we talk about the budget, especially early in the process, like we are now, it's important to talk about Act 1 of 2006. Act 1 of 2006 certainly has many implications as uh, with regard to budget. Um, you may recall that we already passed the resolution not to exceed the Act 1 index. That's one of the, uh, one of the steps um, that's laid forth in Act 1. What I wanted to talk about tonight is specifically uh, the real estate tax and the, the um, index that is uh, set on the on the uh, um, real estate taxation so real estate taxes can only uh, be increased by a, a cost of living cap each year um, unless you go through a process for exceptions as I mentioned we already passed a resolution so we that door is closed for us this year um, the act one index is a cost of living uh, adjustment or an economic indicator that combines two factors the statewide weekly wage rate statewide average weekly wage rate, which is a state uh, measure of economic growth, and the federal uh, em uh, employer cost index, which is a federal measure. Um, so they're smushed together, if you will, to come up with a uh, an statewide Act 1 index that's calculated annually by the Pennsylvania Department of, Department of Education. You may recall that this year the Act 1 index is 2.6%. That index is then adjusted by a local measure of wealth, um, which is called the market value personal income aid ratio, and it's either adjusted upward or downward based on your local wealth. For East Penn, it was up, it's typically been adjusted upward, and uh, this year the adjusted Act 1 index would be 3%. Again, that 3% is the maximum millage increase that you could be applied in a given year. So you can see the uh, computation there. And so that's in terms of real estate taxes, I mean, that generally is one of the um, few areas that a board has to uh, increase revenues or control the budget, if you will, in terms of revenue. So it's it's uh, important to, to have an early look at this and understand what the limitations are in terms of the Act 1 index. As we look forward to a budget, it's always important to look back to know where we came from. And um, so we look back to 2018, 2019, and I'll quickly describe a full budget cycle, if you will. So in June of 2018, we adopted a spending plan for the 2018-19 budget. It was our best guess at that point of what we thought our expenses, revenues and expenses would be. Then in May of 2019, we revised those estimates based on, based on information we knew at that point. And, and so then you have an, an estimated budget. 
And then finally, at the end of the fiscal year, we actually um, you know, go through an audit and then we determine what our, our final uh, financials are. And that's important in terms of moving forward because we have an actual audited ending fund balance. So that's a concrete number, a line in the sand, if you will, and a number that we then carry forward in terms of um, preparing the budget. So the 15.7 uh, million that you see the arrow beside moves forward to the current year. And we'll, I'll get back to, back to that in just a second. But again, in June of 2019, we established the 2019-20 budget. We're now at the point where we're starting to make revisions, estimated revisions. Um, so this is the first piece, which is the beginning fund balance. Uh, and then in March, we'll come back to the board with revenue and expenditure um, uh, revisions. And then we'll continue to update those, as you may recall, throughout the budget process. So you can see that we plug in the 15.7 million as the beginning fund balance, which then gives us a revised ending fund balance, which again then rolls forward to the next fiscal period, 2020-21, and becomes our beginning fund balance. So here we are beginning the process for uh, 2021. Um, this is our first stab at a budget, uh, the preliminary budget for 2021. You can see we've brought forward the beginning fund balance. Um, let me flip my page here. As you can see, this is a balanced budget, which means the total revenues are equal to the total anticipated expenditures. We use total anticipated expenditures because we back out the budgetary reserve. Again, you may recall that budgetary reserve is an amount that's set, so, set aside within the budget uh, in the event of uh, occurrences that are, we believe would be remote in terms of happening. So um, I have a, an experience one time where a district I was in, I think I may have used this example in the past, mid-year, a flood, there was a flood that knocked out a bridge that was between this right in the middle of the district. We actually had to reroute buses for an entire uh, remainder of that year. And so we had to dip into the budgetary reserve. Again, something that we could not have anticipated at the time we put the budget together. Um, but for the most part, we don't anticipate um, spending those funds. So we used anticipated expenditures when looking at the balanced budget. I'd like to just stop here, since this is sort of the foundational work um, in terms of building the budget, and see if there are any questions about where we were, where we are currently, and sort of looking forward and how those numbers roll forward. Any questions I can answer about that process? OK, great. So we'll move on and uh, take a look at our revenue outlook. In terms of um, revenue in the first uh, draft of the budget, we have increased the real estate tax up to the Act 1 index. Again, that's 3%. Um, we've also uh, updated our assessment um, uh, figures that provided by the county. So we've used uh, the assessment growth that's occurred between July and December. You can see that's about six tenths of a percent in terms of additional revenue. We've updated, um, and I've highlighted for you the, the, the bigger numbers, if you will. You do have the budget packet where you can see, you know, there are small tweaks up and down, um, but these are the bigger numbers. In terms of interim real estate taxes, we're actually starting to see a little bit of a decline there. Um, and, and I chalk this up to, um, I believe we're starting to see a change in our real estate market, a, a little bit of a shift, where we were seeing a lot of warehouse development that generated a lot of upfront interim revenue. And now we're seeing more residential developments. We've had a little bit of a shift. And so when you see more residential uh, development, you tend to see higher uh, income in terms of um, real estate transfer tax. So as those uh, houses come online and you start to, to generate the real estate transfer associated with the purchase of those homes. Um, earned income taxes tend to grow with the economy. So as long as we're seeing wages increase year over year, we'll, we tend to see the earned income taxes grow. Um, delinquent real estate taxes, again, year over year, as you, if you're increasing your real estate tax millage rate, your, your tax base is growing, and so you tend to see more de uh, delinquencies. 
not a greater percentage um, necessarily, but uh, the, the amount actually increases. Finally, um, interest on investments. Uh, the interest rate environment is just not favorable to us uh, at this time, and we anticipate that to continue into the next fiscal period. Um, we do tend to be try to be as aggressive as possible uh, within school code res restrictions um, in terms of investments and and uh, um, analyzing our cash flow to make sure we're maximizing our uh, interest revenues. Uh, but unfortunately, the interest rate environment is just such that we'll likely see a decline in the next fiscal period. In terms of state revenues, you may recall that on um, two of the uh, uh, state revenue line items, the basic education uh, funding and the special education funding, what we've typically done and what I've continued to do is actually budget the current year held harmless for next year. Uh, it's a bit of a conservative approach, um, but typically since the, the um, state doesn't adopt their budget until sometime late in June. Uh, we really don't know what the, the final percentage may be. Um, so typically, we plug in the current year, um, and then next year, we pl plug in the following year. So you see growth because we did the same thing last year. So we're seeing growth from budget uh, to budget. Pupil transportation uh, subsidy, you see a, a somewhat significant increase here. Um, the reason for that is when you, the pupil transportation subsidy lags behind your expenses by one year. So in the current year, we're actually being paid for or being reimbursed based on our expenditures in the prior year. You'll re recall that we um, uh, conducted an RFP and engaged in a new contract in the current year and there was a significant increase. So we're anticipating, anticipating a significant increase in uh, transportation subsidy next year to correspond to that. And then finally, the um, state share of retirement uh, is 50, per, we receive 50% reimbursement on our retirement uh, contributions to the public school employees retirement system. So this is a reflection of our increased costs related to that line item. The revenue that you don't see listed here would be federal revenue. And at this point, um, we really, it, it's very difficult to predict from year to year uh, where federal revenues will go. Um, so we have just basically held them harmless until we have better information uh, later this spring. In terms of expenditures, uh, you can see wages are about 2.45%. We've applied um, you know, the rates uh, in, the, in the various collective bargaining agreements and um, compensation plans. Any bargaining agreements that are expiring, we have um, ba basically carried those forward as status quo um, from the current year. In terms of benefits, sort of a high percentage, the two big drivers there are the um, contributions to the pension system and health care insurance. You may recall the last few years we've actually seen 0%. I think we might have even dipped a little bit below zero in one year. Um, this year we're anticipating a 5% increase in medical, um, I'm sorry, we were anticipating a 5% increase in medical insurance. Um, since the time that the, the budget was actually put together, the, some of the early work is the wages and benefits. Um, Th that number has been revised down slightly. Um, you may um, you may recall that the Federal Appropriations Acts of, of 2020 was approved in uh, December of 2019. Part of that uh, act actually repealed portions of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, one of that was a health insurers tax, uh, which was uh, assessed to health insurers to help with the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Health, insur health insurers actually pushed that then back through to their group um, group insurance plans. And so we were affected by, we were actually paying uh, a percentage uh, for that tax. With the elimination of that tax, we actually believe there will be a three quarters of a percent decrease. So at this point, we're anticipating about a four and a quarter percent increase. So that's something that will revise down by the next time you see um, the budget. Um, other services are essentially all of the other things, um, contracted services, um, heat, lights, facilities, et cetera. Um, so that's what's captured in there. Debt service, there's a slight increase. 
This is actually related to the refinancing we did this year. You may recall we took some savings up front and it just, there was a little bit of a mismatch in terms of level, you know, the debt being level. So there's a, a little spike and we'll see uh, in a later chart that that will then fall off in a, in a, a later year. Capital reserve transfer. Um, we will continue to have a, a capital reserve transfer. This is just proposing that there's not an increase. Um, the transfer uh, that's, that is in the budget is 1.64 million, again, the same as the prior year. And then finally, budgetary reserve is budgeted at 5% of the anticipated expenditures, um, which corresponds to a board policy we have. I will uh, just comment here because it, it tends to come up um, from time to time, a question of, well, if we, if we in order to generate more um, revenue, if you will, or less expenses to match up with, with additional spending, could we just reduce the budgetary reserve line item? Recall that when we look at our anticipated expenditures, we back budgetary reserve out. So you could actually increase this number all day or decrease this number all day. The net effect is, is nothing because we back it out um, to get anticipated expenditures. Uh, one of the benefits of, of caring about a 5% budgetary reserve, though, is as you get extra grants or things uh, um, that may affect the budget, if you have a, a small budgetary reserve and your, and your grants or the other things that occur, um, for instance, we had a large insurance claim last year, if you actually exceed your revenue or your expenditure figures, you'd, you'd have to reopen your budget. When you have a large budgetary reserve, it gives some flexibility with those things, um, which has been brought up uh, in the past. Here's a chart um, that I know those who have been on the board have seen uh, year over year. Uh, for those of you who are, on, are new on the board, this is the history of the public school employees' uh, contribu uh, con employer contribution. I'm sorry. Uh, this is a percentage of payroll. So you can see in the current year, it's 34.51%, and that's the percentage of wages. Essentially, I like to explain that percentage this way. For every three people you have working in the district, there's a fourth sort of phantom person that you're paying for into the uh, pension system. So you can see nearly 20 years ago now, um, contributions were very low. At that time, the system was uh, underfunded and uh, that was then realized uh, that it was happening. There should have been a very large spike in the 2009-10 uh, timeframe to go clear up to about 34%. Um, the state couldn't afford that, school districts couldn't afford that, so they put collars on, and you can see that stepped increase. Um, it's gone up each year uh, for several years now. And you can see the projection moving forward is at a much lower pace, slower pace, if you will, than it has been in the past. While the percentage is high, and um, certainly we would be able to use those funds uh, for some other purpose if they were available. The reality is those years where it stepped up were difficult years because you have to build that extra capacity in your budget. You have to figure a way to figure out a way to pay for that. Once you actually get up to that high level, maintaining it becomes much more simple. So I'm not trying to minimize the overall uh, percentage, but simply recognize that there were difficult years. And at least in terms of this item, it's not as difficult. But again, you can see that we're anticipating continued increases. And then this is our um, total debt service, total outstanding debt service um, profile. Um, this represents the debt service payments uh, from now until our debt service will be paid off. The entire bar in each year represents the debt service payment. The yellow portion represents the reimbursement we get back from the Commonwealth through the plan con program. And so the green then represents the net payment that we make. So real quick, very quickly, visually, you can see how much we're getting from the Commonwealth in reimbursement on our debt service each year. You also uh, can see um, how the debt service drops off. So after 2020, uh, sorry, 2020, 2021, we have a slight fall off after 22-23, we have another fall off, and so it steps down. Um, 
Again, we'll talk a little more about this as we look at the long range plan, but it's very important to look at those times and capture that capacity, if you will. The best thing to do is redirect that into your budgetary reserve in order to preserve the capacity. Um, most financial people, uh, like our, like our, our um, bond folks who have come before us, will tell you that in a post Act One environment, so after Act One was um, enacted, it's very difficult when you have to go out for a bond um, um, issuance. If you haven't built capacity in your budget, it's very difficult to be able to to do that. It takes many years to build up to it. Um, you also want to be very careful that you don't redirect that for operational costs because, again, once you redirect it, it disappears and it's not available. So, again, we just want to keep that in the back of our mind um, as we look at budget development and uh, continue moving forward. So. I think I've hit on a number of these, but um, what's what's included in the budget? We have the wage increases. I talked about that. Um, this is one I, I haven't talked about. You may recall um, we had a in the last two years we had a food service a finding in our our audit related to food the food service fund, whereas we were accumulating too many assets. Um, as measured by the National School Lunch Program. And so our um, remediation plan, if you will, was to, to assign those costs, those custodial costs directly related to the operation of the Food Service Fund to the, the, the Food Service Fund. And so from a budgetary standpoint, this is the transfer then of those expenses to the um, Food Service Fund, which obviously then when you look at year over year, you see a decrease in terms of those custodial costs. We talked about the uh, health care increase. We talked about PEASERS. Um, we talked about the real estate tax increase. There are costs, to, all of the costs to maintain the existing programs. And uh, we talked about the, following, the final two items. Um, some things that are not yet in the budget, again, um, just as a reminder, you know the budget is budget development is a process, and so um, there are certain things that we will know later. We don't know today. One of those is the cost savings between retiring employees and new employees, which is sometimes referred to as breakage. You know we tend to know that later in the fiscal uh, cycle when uh, when employees start announcing their retirements. Also, we we don't have that um, real estate tax assessment increase. Um, we've captured it, as I said, from July until December. But from December until May, we haven't captured that. And over the last few years, we've actually seen um, significant increases, if you will, in May. Um, so we believe that we will see that again. It's based on the, the county's assessment cycle. And when they actually go out and, and assess those new developments and put them on the, uh, on the tax rolls. Um, so that's when we, when we see a, a a large jump. We believe we'll see that again. Um, the final health care premium rates, uh, which will likely be four and a quarter percent, there's always the possibility they could be um, adjusted downward slightly. Uh, however, I don't believe they will be. Um, the, at this point, the district priority items are not included in the budget. And this is different from prior years. Over the past few years, at this point, when we were presenting the budget, we actually had capacity, if you will, to include some or all, depending on how many we had in a given year, of those items in the first draft of the budget. Um, at this point, they're not included. Um, as we continue to re revise and update the budget, and I, again, I'll use the word capacity becomes available, we'll start including those um, in the budget. And certainly, it's a, it's a dialogue with the board in terms of which ones go in, which ones don't go in, how far we go, et cetera. Same dialogue we would have had in previous years. Um, at this point, the uh, discussed expansion of the senior real estate tax program is not included in the budget. Um, we are still continuing to data mine for data to evaluate that. Um, I believe, as of the end of last week, I have a valid data set to actually evaluate that. So we'll present that to the board and talk about working that into the budget. And then finally, we talked about the increased contribution to the Capital Reserve Fund. Um, that has been in our long range plan, that even in years there isn't a debt service fall off to try to try to increase that just a little bit if we can. Again, if, if we're not 
able to include the priority items in the budget at this point, it's probably not prudent to be trying to increase the contribution to capital reserve. Again, we're maintaining what that level that we had in the prior year. We just haven't been able to move that up a little bit. So I'd like to pause here and see if I can answer any questions about the items that I've discussed so far. Uh, Mr. Champagne? Yes, yeah, just one quick question. Can you refresh my memory on how you established the uh, the magnitude of the capital reserve I couldn't I couldn't recall what how we agreed to that amount uh, and how what was the basis for the percent of expenditures that we anticipated or percent yeah there, there was actually so in the long-range plan um, there's a there are two metrics we looked at um, gosh it's been a while since I looked at them I believe it is um, it's our it's our total value of our plant from an insurance standpoint. Um, if you don't have the you, answer, you can get back. Are to you that. asking about yeah. the capital capital reserve transfer? No, yeah. How the, the how the, the value was set? I uh, couldn't I couldn't recall, and I forgot that it was in the capital plan. Let me just let me if I may ask a clarifying question. Are you referring to each year the amount, or in total what the target is for the capital reserve? The year that the amount we're going to fund in the particular year. How 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 are we establishing that? You know, I know that we talked about a methodology that looked at the total plant and and of, of the of the district, and on a depreciated basis, you know, this would suggest we should put X amount of dollars. I can't remember the amount that was you know the factor. But I didn't remember how we got the 1.64, and I just don't know if that was what was available or there was a was part of a formulaic discussion that we you know concluded that was the right amount. Yeah. So the 1.64 actually we we have arrived there um, in the the last time we had the debt service a debt service fall off was the year that the full day kindergarten was implemented. So a portion of that fall off was used for full day kindergarten. The remaining portion was redirected. Okay. So that combined with what we had already put in um, at that time gave us X amount. Then there's another component, which is the annual um, contribution from the Lehigh Valley Health Network for the uh, Memorial Field Project. That's also being redirected. Um, as well as savings, because if you recall, the athletic trainers, $40,000 each yeah. year for athletic trainers. So um, that's how we get to the 1.64, that 40,000 is the, is the trainers. Um, that is all, that is, there's a page in the long range plan that breaks out um, those I'll portions. Go back, I'll go back and look at that. I, I couldn't find my long range plan, so that was. Yeah, right. and then moving forward in the long range plan, what we've tried to do is capture the fall off each I, year. In, in the debt service. And in years where there wasn't a fall off, I think it was about $100,000 that was earmarked to try to pull in. Again, just to, to grow that capacity right. um, if possible. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Smith? Um, I had a couple two two questions um the first one um in terms of what is not included in next year's budget currently um you had mentioned that the federal um contribution was not out until later this spring is should that be in here as well or is that yes let me Thank clarify you. so the federal you're referring to the federal revenues yeah yeah, so the federal revenues are included, but there's no adjustment upward or downward from the current year. Okay. If that makes sense. Because we don't know if we'll get we don't know if we'll get more money or less money right. next year. Okay. I I thought you had said you just hadn't put that in at all. Okay. No, essentially we it's held harmless until we have better information. Gotcha. So then the that kind of leads into my next um, question or just something something to think about. Um, this is the first year that we haven't, as you mentioned, um, talked to, or seen the priority items in terms of how they fit into this uh, very preliminary budget. Um, typically in the past, it's been helpful to, to see the um, original budgetary increase, that number slowly tick down as we, we get through each benchmark of the, of the process. Um, I, you know, and I fully understand this is very, very preliminary, but 
um, it, it is a little concerning to me to, to see that um, without having our priorities included, we're already sitting up against the, the full adjusted Act 1 index of 3%. So um, it looks, and just reading the tea leaves, we're not going to be um, privy to that same benefit of being able to move into, okay, then what's our next priority? What's our next priority? And then watch that number still continue to come down. So I just, um, uh, again, with the caveat that this is very preliminary, I would um, like to uh, just make everybody aware that um, as we are looking at our priorities, uh, while it's not necessarily something that we can, we can list in terms of a uh, a position to add it's still a priority I think um, and and in our mind that you know going up to the full act one index is, is certainly a, a, a little bit of a priority and, and a concern for us as well so sure. there's something to think about going forward absolutely it's a, a great observation thank you for pointing that out dr. Munson yes my my question actually in some ways is related on the revenue outlook slide uh, slide eight um, it, the the information is the information on the the outlook for the real estate tax assumes the full possible act one adjusted act one uh, millage increase of three percent. I know last year uh, we you did a scenario analysis so that we could see how these numbers changed at different millage rates. When when in the process? Well, actually, I don't care when it was this year. At which of these sessions uh, do you plan to to do that? That would be in March when we bring the to March. you. Okay. Yeah, the long range fiscal and capital Great. plan. Yeah, thank you. Sure. I would say also that probably in the January meeting last year we had a full use of the act one don't we typically have a full use of the act one index in the yes first that's my recollection as well okay, thank you any other questions okay, okay. moving on and I believe back to the So Mr. Saul just talked about the district priorities, which at this point are not within the budget. Um, however, I would like to provide the board with an overview of what our team has identified as priorities as we continue to work throughout the budget process. Um, I do want to also just spend just a, a very brief amount of time sharing with the board and the community the process by which we as a team identify the district priorities. It is a very collaborative process. Um, the identification of priorities begins at the individ individual building leader and or department leader level. Um, we then, in administrative team meetings in various settings, it might be the elementary principals together, it might be the secondary principals together, and then our entire cabinet. So that would be our building as well as district level administration. Um, work through the process in small teams of really vetting those priorities and ultimately identifying which of the priorities are most tightly aligned with the goals of the, of the organization. So that's really what you see before you this evening. Um, I'll start with, you'll notice as well that several, many of the priorities um, are actually personnel, which as we then know would be recurring costs. So you'll see there is one resource or programmatic priority that's on there. So in priority order, um, one of our um, requests will be for an emotional support teacher in particular at the elementary level. I will share as well, given the immediacy of this particular priority, it is district administration's recommendation that we actually fill that position this spring. And so you will see later this evening on the agenda a recommendation in the personnel section for a teacher to fill that emotional support position. Pending approval of that particular position, that would then be incorporated into the budget as an existing expense. And so we would then eliminate it from the district priority list going forward to 2020-21. The literacy resources at the elementary level, for those board members who were with us last year, you might recall that we began to implement 
literacy resources, particularly in grades kindergarten, first grade, and we also purchased some resources for second grade. And so our, our, our goal this year was that we would be able to continue with implementation of those resources, finishing out second grade, and then moving into third grade and some resources resources as well for fourth and fifth grade. And so when we talk about literacy resources, those are reading materials that students would be using, as well as assessments that teachers would be using to identify reading levels of students. You'll notice the next two items are referencing priorities for learning support teachers in total. That would be for two learning support teachers who you can see would be shared across four elementary buildings. Learning support teachers are teachers who have a degree in special education and they would be working specifically with those students at our elementary level who have an IEP or an individualized education plan and specifically have a learning disability. So that is a learning support teacher um, has a different area of expertise or is working with students of a different disability than the emotional support teacher up above. The next priority is for a behavior support interventionist and that's identified as a position that ultimately would be working district-wide. So that's in essence a K-12 to position. We envision that that particular individual again would be a, a professional staff member, so potentially on the teacher contract, but when we talk about the word behavior support interventionist, we would be looking for a professional who has a certification specifically in behavior analysis. The, the acronym is BCBA, Board Certified Behavior Analyst. And so that would be someone who um, has a special certification and training in terms of working with students teachers, specifically working on behaviors. The next position is a staff, a staff assistant at one of our middle schools. And a staff assistant is a support personnel position. And that individual in particular would be used to supervise students who are in the cafeteria during lunchtime at one of our middle schools. You'll also see in terms of a staffing request, um, a request for a technology specialist. Currently we have six technology specialists that are part of our technology department. And those individuals um, work in all 10 buildings with all of our hardware, all of our technology that is throughout the district. Um, really helping to troubleshoot, address technical problems or issues that might arise. And currently, want, we have a position that is a part-time position. That position has been vacant for over a year, and we as an organization have had a really tough time filling that position, in particular because it is a part-time position and it just is not attractive to many candidates. And so it's been posted multiple times. And so A, we have a need for greater support. And we also believe that making that position full time, we feel more confident that we'd actually be, be able to fill that position. The final two positions are actually administrative positions one of which is a district-wide position to, um, in the area of looking at and leading our educational alternatives. And when we use the term educational alternatives, we're talking about a variety of programs, some of which we currently have and have had in the district for some time. Examples include VESPA, which is our East Penn cyber learning option, Another example is our Learning to Succeed program, which is a program that's in existence at Emmaus High School, particularly for students who, for any number of reasons, might be experiencing difficulty in a traditional school day. And so they actually come to school after school hours and receive instruction during that period of time. Some other programs are we certainly have um, a variety of regular ed as well as special education students who for uh, different reasons um, are placed 
periodically in alternative placements. So those would be placements outside of the East Penn School District, oftentimes specialized programs to address whatever need they, those students might be presenting. And finally, as you know, we have um, some new alternative programs that we certainly look to continue to expand in East Penn, Jasper being one of them. Um, I mentioned that just in terms of there are the potential for more alternative programs on the horizon. I certainly don't want the board to interpret it in terms of this particular leadership position is seen as a priority simply because of Jasper. I give that up. I give that as an example of things down the road. Um, but in particular, um, a leader in that position would certainly look at of those some those programs that I just mentioned, as well as others, and analyzing how those programs are currently functioning, as well as how those programs could ultimately help students be more successful. And the final position is also an administrative position, um, and that particular and that particular position we've referred to it for now as an inclusion specialist. And so that particular administrative position would be working closely with our special education and student services departments, our curriculum department, as well as our building leaders in terms of when we talk about inclusion, really what we're talking about is doing our very best job of meeting the needs of all learners to the greatest extent possible in a regular education classroom. There are certainly times when it's appropriate for students who have an identified um, need who are currently in special education. There are certainly times where it's appropriate for them to receive their services in a pull-out separate classroom. But we know that there are also many times when it is appropriate for students to be included in their regular education classrooms with their regular ed peers. And as a matter of fact, you know that the law requires us to look at providing students with as many of those opportunities as possible. In an organization of 8,200 students, 10 buildings, beginning to plan for the successful implementation of inclusion in an appropriate way certainly takes a considerable amount of a leadership and collaboration. And so as we look to be more inclusive in our practices in the district, we see this as a need among our leadership team. You can see there the, um, the costs of our priorities that we've identified at this point, again, none of which are currently in the budget. As we wrap up this evening, um, again, I, I want to just echo what Mr. Saul has said throughout this presentation this evening, that as you all know and hopefully realize, the budget process is just that. It's a process. And so we are at the very beginning of that process. And we really look forward to continuing to work with the board in future presentations as we now delve more deeply into each of these priorities and continue to really clarify the vision and the work that each of these priorities would have and the impact that they would have on our organization. We're happy to answer any, any high-level questions that you might have about the priorities or any other, any other questions about what we've shared this evening. Ms. Bowman. Um, I actually just have a couple questions for the future that I thought I'd, um, you don't need to answer these tonight. Um, for the, when the literary resources comes up later, um, I thought it would be helpful if we could get an update on how the resources that we voted in last year, what's, I, I realize it's probably way too early for metrics, but it, it would be he good to hear like how students um, embrace those, how um, teachers or whoever are working with those resources, how they embrace them and how that went to help us to feel confident about um, further um, going down that road, if that makes sense. And then it was a little, and I don't need to know the answer to this one tonight either, but I'm a little confused about the inclusion specialist and how that's different from um, what other professionals are already doing so it'd be great if like that distinction was um, explained a little more um, and then the, the only other question I have is whether these are in order of importance assuming that like we can only do a few or depending on how budgetary money opens up or if they're not if they could be put in order of importance for us 
I'll work in reverse order, and I and I I won't answer them because I appreciate you just sharing your feedback with us in a preliminary. Um, but the the last one is is an easy one that we can we're certainly able to answer tonight. They are in priority order already for you. Um, and absolutely, the goal of future presentations is to paint a clear picture of how of the work of positions and how they may re, maybe vary from other positions in the organization. Um, and then thank you for for asking for feedback on our literacy resources because absolutely, I think it's really important for us to have an understanding in terms of how those resources have positively impacted student learning, even though, again, thank you for recognizing as well it has been a relatively short period of time that we've had those literacy resources in our primary classrooms. Question, Mr. Champagne. Yeah, just one quick question is for not not to be answered this evening, but as we look down and we, we you know we continue to add techni technology people and I I know we have a, a, a very robust technology plan, but this position along with others are maintaining hardware and have we ever considered outsourcing that? Because we're we're paying not only that salary, but thirty four thousand dollars on top of that salary, a thirty four percent on top of that salary. So have we ever looked at outsourcing the hardware maintenance and function. You know, as when I was at PPL Computer Aid, which is a local company, did a lot of the, you know, hardware, you know, maintaining of systems because it was at a much less expensive. They can spread their fixed cost over a bigger base. And I'm just curious if we've ever evaluated that. Thank you. Actually, I think these include benefits. These are total costs it's, here. Yes, we've tried to be inclusive and include yes. benefits right, in okay. there. So that's low, I think, because that's going from part-time to full-time. That's the differential from what the position currently is to what it would be. Uh, Mr. Jankowski. Um, <clears throat> the, the Director of Educational Alternatives and the Inclusion Specialist, what information did you did you use for to establish the the salary or the the wages and benefits here? Uh, was there a benchmarking done uh, from local school districts, or, or what's the resource for the basis for these amounts? Do you want to take that one? Um, essentially, it was um, sort of ballparking what what it may cost for someone in that position. There were there were not there was not any. Um, sort of technical research done to say what what is the equivalent in terms of cost. So I can tell you, for instance, the Director of Educational Alternatives, that's a $100,000 salary, very round figure, and then the you know the, the remaining 75000 represents the benefit, so. Okay, thanks. Are there any other time uh, Mr. Smith. Just real quick, uh, Mr. Champion's question actually made me think of this. Um, would the technology specialist is the benefits are included in that, but is PSERS, a PSERS contribution attached to the technology specialist? There is one. Okay. I wasn't sure if there was. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? Uh, I'd like to offer two comments, and one is um, as a uh, you indicated in the schedule of events um, the detailed presentations. I know the board is very believes those are very helpful. I know that's a recently started um, activity, and I found it personally very helpful. And I think the other board members have also, and I hope the public uh, does as well. So I applaud uh, that innovation. And I'd also like to point out um, hidden in Mr. Saul's presentation this. Um, uh, expected uh, budget sort of midway through the budget process. That's also a new uh, thing that Mr. Saul brought, brought to this district. Um, we used to stick with our initial estimate, um, which makes it easy to know what all the changes are, actual changes in the budget. So this puts a little more uh, work on his team to differentiate what is changes in assumptions and what is actual changes in in programs, uh, but I think that's also very helpful, and it allows our final budget to come much closer to actuals. And I think we'll see that we see that in the in the results. So I just like to point that out. And thank you. Any other comments or questions? Thank you. Thanks.
you very much. <laughs> Uh, next on the agenda is the district update. Uh, Campbell. Okay. Um, I wanted to provide the community with an update regarding the Jasper program, which, as you know, we will be implementing for the first time for our ninth, our, our ninth graders for the 2020-21 school year. And in particular, on February 10th, so next month, um, we are offering parent information sessions for the parents of any current eighth graders who are interested in learning more about Jasper. And those sessions will be held, there will be a session that will be held here at the East Penn Administration Building on February 10th from 12 to 1. So we're offering a lunchtime session for anyone that might be available at that time of the day. And then also on February 10th, that same day in the evening, um, starting at 4 p.m. through 6 p.m., we will have um, administrators available to meet families at Iyer Middle School. So again, February 10th is another opportunity for parents to come and sit down with some of our leaders of Jasper in an informal way to learn more about the program and, and whether or not that program might be a good fit for their, for their students. I'd also like to recognize that PSBA has designated January this, this entire month as School Director Recognition Month. And this is really an opportunity for community members to celebrate and recognize the, the vital work that our school board members do really on behalf of the entire educational com community. We recognize the not only the amount of time that a, board, a, a school director devotes to their responsibilities, which as we saw tonight, includes making those important financial decisions, um, evaluating student safety and security issues, as well as hiring decisions. As locally elected officials, our school directors truly are invested in their communities and student education. So on behalf of the East Penn community, I would like to take this moment to express our, our gratitude for our nine board members for their dedication, time, and efforts. And I assure you that the work that you do for our schools um, really does have an incredible impact. So thank you. Thank you. Following uh, a great budget, presentation this evening. I'd also like to congratulate Bob Saw, who's our East Penn Business Admin Administrator, as you know. He was recently appointed to the Board of Trustees of the Pennsylvania School District Liquid Asset Fund. And this particular board was created in 1982 to assist local governments in Pennsylvania to help manage their investment needs. And so I think Bob's appointment to this particular board really is a testament to his outstanding reputation as a leader in public financial management. And we're incredibly proud of his ongoing leadership, not just at the district level, but among municipal business administrators as well. So congratulations. Uh, earlier this evening, Grace Comfort provided you with a, a brief update regarding History Day. And so, Dr. Munson, I hope I have the answer to your question. Um, <laughs> on January 2nd, we had over 70 high school students who participated in the Emmaus High School History Day program. This year's theme was Breaking Barriers in History, and the first and second place projects in each category will advance to the regional competition at Muhlenberg at the end of March. Oh, okay. And we do have 28 students who will be advancing to regionals. Um, so about half of our student entrants will then proceed on in the competition. And their project categories included individual and group documentaries, web exhibits, performances, websites, and historical papers. Um, and, and many of us had the opportunity when at the di district level competition to stop over and view the projects and really were just amazed with the level of work that our students continue to produce. Later in the month of January, approximately 300 students from Iyer Middle School literally rocked the night away <laughs> in support of the Justin W. Jennings Foundation. And so our, our Iyer students, beginning at 7.30 p.m. on January 17th through 7 a.m. the following morning, um, worked in teams to keep a rocking chair rocking the entire time. Um, while students weren't rocking, they joined in a variety of events at the school. We had dodgeball tournaments, hip-hop dance classes, art classes, 
um, and even cooking classes. And the amazing piece is this year, our 300 students at IRE set a new record by raising over $27,000. So I wanted to give a special thank you to our IRE teachers, Kelsey Torpy and Sue Bauer, who helped to coordinate the, the event. And I also wanted to thank many of the IRE teachers and staff members who literally were there overnight as well as parent volunteers who I would say they were on site to keep the kids up all night but I happened to have a volunteer shift from 11 to 1 a.m. and I can tell you that the kids were far more awake than um, <laughs> than the adults but it really was just an amazing event to witness also a congratulations to our Emmaus High School golf team for being named class 3a golf team of the year by the morning call um, you might recall that that now puts them with with many of our other teams at Emmaus High School who earned a similar recognition in terms of team of the year. <coughs> and finally, we are looking forward. It's time already to start planning for kindergarten registration for the 2020-21 school year. So kindergarten registration in East Penn will be held at each of our elementary schools during the week of March 23rd. New this year, we will be having parents complete the registration documentation online. And so we encourage parents to visit any of the elementary building or district website for details about kindergarten registration. There's contacts there, so if there are any families who need help with resources, um, simply need to reach out and we're happy to do that. But again, we encourage families, um, if you have children who will be five by September 1st, or if you have a neighbor, please encourage everyone to come out and register as soon as possible because that then helps us for planning for the upcoming school year thank you I will be registering okay <laughs> <laughs> are there any comments or questions for mrs. King <clears throat> dr. Munson just one short one thank you for um, letting us know about the the with rockathon is the name of it yes. right the rockathon yes. uh, and I, I have to say I I'm not sure I can think of any other metric of the dedication of the staff of this district that there's actually people who volunteered to spend all night with sugar addled <laughs> middle school students. So thank you. Great people, yeah. Mrs. Bowman. Just a comment, um, just to congratulate uh, Mr. Saul on the achievement. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Any other comments or questions? Thank you, Mrs. Campbell. Sure. Um, moving on to uh, personnel, may I have a motion for items 1 through 12? So moved. Second. Any comment or discussion? Dr. Munson. Yeah, I wanted to say uh, one thing, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back into this by saying I feel like we've been spoiled um, by the previous years of budget discussion and, and their quality and depth. And I say that because I actually want to explain why I'm going to vote no on this item. Um, I, I, I guess I'm ultimately not comfortable um, with a, a personnel vote that actually creates a new position because unlike the other new positions that we have um, contemplated, I don't feel like we've gone through the same level of, of public review, although we have, you, you know, been gotten some information about this position. Um, and I say that because I don't want um, my no vote to be taken in any way as um, detracting from the qualifications um, of the individual people who are in the personnel list. But um, that's why I'm going to vote no. Mr. Champagne? Yeah, I guess not quite the same um, concerns that Dr. Munson raised, but I am just a little concerned about now we're, we're, we're almost to the, well, we're in the next budget cycle, we're almost toward the end of the academic, moving toward the end of the academic year, and now we're starting to dip into the budgetary reserve to fund this position. And I guess I'm of the opinion that if this position was so critical, why wasn't it kind of put in front of us at the beginning of the academic cycle? And then I also am concerned that you know we're, we're, we're now embedding another position into the budget that we just heard was a, I know it's a top priority, but we haven't vetted it fully. And so I'm, I'm not in support of moving forward at this time either. I'm not saying we don't need this position in the district, but I'm, with the lack of information and clarity surrounding this, I'm not comfortable voting affirmative at this point. Any other comments? I would say 
in past years we have uh, as need unexpected needs have arisen it's we have um, added positions mid mid uh, year in the past um, typically it's actually been earlier in the year for example um, uh, enrollment higher than expected or something like that I'm assuming that I mean maybe Ms. mrs. Campbell or uh, mr. Saul can talk about it if it's something that was predictable last year it probably would have been in the in the budget presentations I think this is a uh, unexpected uh, requirement um, that is a the number one need for the district uh, from the presentation so and and I certainly appreciate the questions and we'll share um, Mr. Champagne, to your you know very logical question in terms of why the position was not put forward last year in preparation for this year, um, as we look at the caseload of those students who are receiving emotional support services at at Shoemaker, we do have several who are kindergartners, some of whom would have then began the year with us, um, and based on concerns that that were or behaviors that were demonstrated that were in, impacting their learning. Um, we then went through the special ed evaluation process and they were identified as needing services. And so sometimes those caseloads, um, as we're looking at what those caseloads would, would have been last spring, even going into the summer, then we oftentimes can, it is possible that we start a school year and we have students who are newly identified and or move into the district who we didn't know. And so therefore those caseloads then can, can change quite suddenly. Are any other comments or questions? Ms. Allen, will you call the roll? Ms. Bauman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? No. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Dr. Munson? No. Mr. Smith? Aye. Ms. Winch? Aye. Dr. Bacher? Aye. Seven ayes, two nays. Motion passes. Uh, moving on to business operations, uh, I, will someone uh, provide a motion for, oh, personnel. I'm sorry, personnel. personnel. <laughs> As we just um, discussed the, the personnel item, there were a few comments that I, that I wanted to share. First of all, um, you saw on the agenda this evening that Mr. Moan, Michael Moan, will retire from East Penn having served as our Director of Technology for 12 years, and I wanted to recognize him. Prior to joining East Penn, Michael served as Director of Information Technology in the, North An in the Nazareth Area School District, and then for a period of time before that had um, worked for Colonial IU, and so collectively Michael has worked in education supporting students and staff for over 34 years, and we certainly wish him well in his retirement. And I will then follow that up with um, officially introducing and welcoming Lisa Manzo to East Penn. We are thrilled to have Lisa join our leadership team. She will serve as Director of Technology and brings really a unique blend of experience in both technology and instruction. A little bit about her. Um, she has 12 years of experience as a classroom teacher as well as a gifted support specialist. And for the past four and a half years, she's been working as the supervisor of technology in the Easton Area School District. And so in her role, in her current role in Easton, she's led various large-scale changes, including the implementation of a one-to-one -one learning program at the secondary level, and really has been pivotal in terms of planning and facilitating professional learning for staff in terms of the meaningful integration of technology. And so we look forward to having her join us and I invite her to come up and receive congratulations from each of our board members. Welcome. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Congratulations. Welcome. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations and welcome. Sorry. I 
so we certainly look forward to Lisa being able to begin her her leadership in East Penn and I just wanted to to wrap up with regard to the personnel section and take a moment and also recognize Val Witkowski um, who is one of our leaders in our technology department who has been taking on me many leadership responsibilities during our transition and so we certainly appreciate Val's work as well thank you Thank you, Mrs. Campbell. Um, moving on now to business operations. May I have a motion for uh, items A through D? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Mrs. Allen, will you call the roll, please? Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Dr. Munson? Aye. Smith? Aye. Ms. Winch? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Dr. Bacher? Aye. Nine ayes. Motion's passed. I'd like to make a comment on the donation that uh, the uh, East Penn uh, Education Foundation um, gives many donations throughout the year and uh, just appreciate their um, work to um, improve the STEAM education in the district. So thank you. Uh, now I'll entertain a motion for item E, the agreement of sale. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion or comment? Mrs. Allen, will you call the roll, please? Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Dr. Munson? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Ms. Winch? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Dr. Bacher? Aye. Nine ayes. Motion passes. Um, Mrs. Campbell? I, I just um, I wanted to make a comment with regard to the agreement that was just approved by the board. In particular, um, that particular piece of property is adjacent to Jefferson Elementary School, and I wanted to assure the community that a portion of that property will continue to be used as playground space for our Jefferson students. And I, I recognize that Wes Barrett was joining us this evening, and I wanted to thank Wes Barrett as well as Sarah Stauffer for their willingness to work with the district. Um, I found them both to be very transparent and fair throughout our negotiation process and I know that they too are glad to that the Jefferson students will continue to have that outdoor play space for them. Thank, Thank you. you. Moving on to edu educational conferences. Um, may I have a motion please? So, so moved. Second. Second. <laughs> <laughs> Any comments? Dr. Munson. Yeah, I actually have a question. Um, what is the, why do we need to approve conferences that cost zero dollars? I know in some cases they've actually had a cost, but they were covered outside of our budget. But there's others here that cost zero. Is, is there a statutory reason that we have to approve or a policy reason or any reason at all? I, I don't believe so, and I'm looking at um, Ms. Whitman, who comes from our CNI team, and we ourselves have been asking this same question a little bit. So perhaps we take a closer look at that and really bring things to the board that have a dollar value associated with them. Having said that, I will say that sometimes there might be a cost of a sub associated with the staff member yes, who's in true. that position. Um, but we continue to, to take a look at our practices and try to streamline them as much as possible. I mean, in, in some ways, it's, it's nice to see how much um, expertise is being gained and, and how much networking our district personnel are doing with others. Uh, so I, I mean, that wasn't 100% criticism. It was just, I, I mean, I just wondered. And then I just wondered if there was something I was missing. And then there, there also might, at times, there might be like reimbursement for mileage for the individual traveling to and from the conference. So that may not always necessarily be reflected ah, there okay. in the cost. But yeah, I think it's a good to, for the board to see the conferences that mm -hmm. people are attending. I agree with you. If it was a whole list of zero, it would probably be better to be informational rather than um, approval. Mm -hmm. But as long as there are some that are, are a dollar figure, uh, I enjoy reading where we're sending our teachers and other professionals. Fair enough. Um, any other comments or questions? Mrs. Allen, will you call the roll, please? Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Dr. Levinson? 
Aye. Dr. Munson? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Ms. Winch? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Dr. Bacher? Aye. Nine ayes. Motion passes. Uh, next, we have a re uh, report from the CLIU. Ms. Bowman? Um, this meeting's actually tomorrow. So, oh. yeah, it, the, it would have normally been a week ago, but that was Martin Luther King Day. Okay. So, there's no report. So, next next meeting. Well, yes. I can't go to the meeting tomorrow, so maybe they'll be <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, next up is a report from the LCTI, uh, Mr. Champagne. Yes. Uh, a number of things. First of all, uh, it was uh, our pleasure to have Gabrielle Howarth, uh, an ESH junior. She was a student representative at our meeting this past uh, Wednesday. Uh, every mo meeting, we always have a student representative from one of the districts. And she's a culinary arts student and current vice president of the Future Career and Community Leaders of America. Uh, she gave a report on the FCCLA fundraising activities. But she was also instrumental because she helped prepare the dinner that the board members had that evening. She's a wonderful uh, uh, cook because of her work, in the, in, especially in uh, preparing desserts and so forth. You may recall she won a gold medal in a competition this past summer uh, for her work. And I'm also proud to say she and she's uh, my neighbor, along with Ms. Dr. Bacher's neighbor. So um, the welding lab, uh, they're basically down to the last few items on the punch list. Uh, equipment is being installed this week. The grand opening is scheduled for uh, February 5th with a snow date on February 7th. All board members, including those who are not participants on the JOC, are invited just need to RSVP to Precious Petty, who is the, you know, the, the per, per, point person there. Her telephone number is 610-799-1350 for interested in attending. Again, it's at 1 o'clock on February 5th. Um, and the students should be in the lab later in February as so they final, do final cleanup and so forth. Uh, District 11 Skills USA competition will be held this Wednesday uh, at the Ag Hall in the Allentown Fairgrounds. That's always a, a a, a very good event for kids to demonstrate their uh, capabilities. It's uh, all the tech schools in the district, and those that are successful will go on to state competition. Uh, Camp LCTI is uh, that is uh, going to be held this uh, June 15th through 19th. So it was only going to be one week this summer. Uh, registration is uh, begins on March 1st for fifth and eighth through eighth graders, and those that register before May 1st get a free T-shirt. So if you're interested, more information is available on the LCTI website. And finally, we did approve the 2021 General Operating Fund and Academic Center budget uh, with the one exception that it was reduced by $50,000 by moving certain fees for architecture and design to uh, be part of the capital plan. What this means for uh, East Penn is roughly a $79,000 increase in the general fund and about $12,000 in the academic center and the key drivers are similar to things that mr saul reviewed this with us salaries and health care costs that's my report any questions any questions thank you for your report uh, moving on to announcements there is no executive session before today's meeting our next regularly scheduled board meeting will be monday february 10th here at 7 30. i'll now entertain a motion to adjourn so moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Meetings adjourned.